to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Howdy, guys. How's it going? Hey, hey. Good. What's going on, everyone? Great to be with you guys today. Listeners, it's always great to have you, of course. We want to continue our season three here on the Tanakh. It's been a great season so far, and uh, we trust that it's been encouraging and provoking. I've got another good episode for you today. We took a little while to plan this one, uh, and uh, we hope that it's fruitful for you. But last time, guys, what did we work through? So last time we uh, touched a lot on um, Jacob and his sons in Second Temple. Jewish tradition. And uh, we spoke a lot from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs and some of the major themes that uh, developed there. Yeah, and so the um, apocalyptic writers, they kind of project, extrapolate Genesis 49 to, uh, you know, Jacob's 12 sons doing the same thing with their kids. And uh, in Talking about the end times or the times the the times to come, uh, so there's a lot of themes of the day of the Lord, the resurrection, the judgment, and Jewish uh, Jewish election and context, all that. So, yeah. So if that's where we left off last time, the natural place to go at this point is to talk about Moses, because Moses, of course, is one of the most important figures of the Hebrew Bible. So let's take a, a few minutes just to introduce Moses. Who is Moses, and how does the Tanakh lay him out? Well, I think of several ways. Um, the first, you could say Moses was a deliverer, the one who delivered Israel out of Egypt. And, you know, we see this in, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 3, and everything going on there. Moses is also portrayed as a miracle worker, someone who, um, through God's hand, brings plagues upon Egypt. We see that, um, the splitting of the Red Sea. Moses gives the Torah, or it gives the law to Israel. Um, he's portrayed as a lawgiver as well. He also serves as a mediator or an intercessor between God and Israel. Uh, and we see this over and over and over again. Uh, for instance, Exodus 32 in the story of the golden calf, uh, Moses stands and goes, God, you can't destroy this people because you made a promise to Abraham. So he stands as a mediator or as an intercessor. In many ways, you know, Joshua goes on to serve as a military commander for the people of Israel, but Moses serves as a, a kind of military leader in some senses, during the people's wanderings in the wilderness. And so we see him portrayed like that. And finally, we see him portrayed as a judge who's settling disputes. God raises him up um, to help settle disputes between the people of Israel. But ultimately, all of these roles and how the Tanakh presents Moses are secondary to his role of a prophet and how he hears the words of God and speaks them to the people of Israel. So that's what we want to spend a majority of our time talking about today in terms of Moses' authority as a prophet and then how this gets developed through Second Temple literature and then into the New Testament. So how does Moses shape the hermeneutic of the Tanakh and Second Temple literature in the fact that he is a prophet and he has authority as a prophet? This is how the Tanakh and Second Temple literature and ultimately the New Testament presents the importance of Moses is his prophetic authority is what's appealed to constantly over and over and over again. And I think we can see this clearly in the period of the apostles, where Moses' authority continues to endure. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the centrality in this, uh, of Moses in kind of hermeneutics and interpreting the scriptures, his authority is evident, for example, at uh, the Jerusalem Council. At the end of that, you know, when James says, uh, fr uh, from ancient generations, Moses has, uh, in every city, those who proclaim him, he's read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so Moses really sits at the center of the revelation of God and, uh, and, and how we understand Israel's narrative. And so Jewish apocalyptic writings fill that void and, and kind of fill Moses with eschatological revelation, not just 
the revelation that we get expressly in the Tanakh. And so we'll see that today as we kind of start working through passages uh, that Moses doesn't just receive the law and Leviticus, and but he receives a lot more about the future and the end of the age. Which, interesting, similar to last week, where where you could see where they would take the idea, since what Jacob says to his sons is he's going to show them what happens to them in the latter days. So you could see where that would be um, played out a little bit more. It's, and it's similar in Moses. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's underappreciated how eschatologically oriented a lot of what Moses teaches is, um, especially in the book of Deuteronomy. It's, it's acknowledged in, in, you know, it's been acknowledged for a long time in the academic world, but it's, but it's dismissed in that because Moses isn't really credited with writing Deuteronomy. So Moses, Moses, uh, Moses role as a prophet is, is kind of downplayed because since he's, it wasn't his hand that wrote Deuteronomy anyways, and the other eschatological passages, then, then it's played down. But really it, his, his emphasis on the last days, like Deuteronomy four, verse 30 He's going to he's going to say that there's going to be a long period of scattering, and then they're going to be like some people talk about the pattern of scattering and repentance and regathering to the land, and then rebellion, scattering or exile, and and that cycle, yep. yeah, this this the cycle, and uh, but like Deuteronomy thirty or uh, Deuteronomy four verse thirty says there's going to be a decisive end to the cycle when they're conclusively regathered to the land in the latter days. Deuteronomy 31, 29, uh, similarly, it's kind of the introduction to the book of Moses, or to I'm sorry, to the Song of Moses in chapter 32. And he says, and I know the the mind you have in you today and where it's going and and all the evils that are going to befall you until the the last days, and then the Lord will regather you, and it's going to be the decisive end. So, essentially, Moses has this reputation as being a prophet, not like John said, not just because he gave us, you know, the food laws and we know how to behave in the temple, but because additionally, like he basically says that he saw, this is in the Tanakh, he basically says that he saw all of Jewish history playing out. Like he saw these patterns and cycles, and then the Lord actually showed him, Deuteronomy 30, the claim in in chapter 31 is that he saw all the way through how they were going to behave and misbehave throughout their history, the ups and downs, and then there would be a decisive conclusion to this cycle. And so you can understand uh, the kind of the, how, how he would be, you know, really emphasized in apocalyptic literature in that way. A lot of his experiences, like the Sinai experience, which we'll probably spend more time on in the future, they, um, his revelatory experiences get amplified quite a bit to kind of, to kind of emphasize this, the, the, the apocalyptic nature or the revelatory nature of the things that he shared. So um, I think that it, it's really easy to understand in Moses, just like in the 12 patriarchs, how they would use him as somebody who had intimate knowledge of where history was going and of the events related to the end times. Right. I think the, you know, the, the specific people in, in the Hebrew Bible, it, you know the ta- the Tanakh paints them as seeing into the future, but then the apocalyptic literature kind of fills in that future as uh, in more descriptive ways with messianic yeah. expectation, specifically, uh, you know, with the final theophany of the day of God and the resurrection of the dead and the stuff, the specifics that aren't talked about in the Tanakh, it's or in the 
you know, the, the Pentateuch or the Torah itself then get played out in the prophetic literature. And then in apocalyptic literature, you know, you get it much more expressly uh, 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 described within the narrative itself. So, for example, 4, 4th Ezra 14, God uh, says to Ezra, I revealed myself in a bush and spoke to Moses when my people were in bondage in Egypt, and I sent him and led my people out of Egypt, and I led him up on Mount Sinai where I kept him with me many days, and I told him many wondrous things and showed him the secrets of the times and declared to him the end of times. And so, uh, where you don't get that described in the Hebrew Bible, but then you get it kind of unfolded more. And then, as you know, in the verses following in chapter 14, it describes it much, much more explicitly. And so, I think this is kind of what happens in the apocalyptic literature is that you get a filling in of the eschatological gaps and kind of uh, pushing it forward to its ultimate end. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, there's, there's, that's a great example of kind of taking, um, you know, a, an event in the Tanakh and accentuating it or, or amplifying it um, to to amplify Moses' role or to just, you know, uh, add an exclamation point to Moses', Moses role in the, uh, in the story of redemption. And I think Second Temple literature is pretty full of... Of uh, of those stories, I mean, if anybody ultimately, if you want to have credibility to add credibility to your idea, then uh, then say that you have the same idea as Moses in the Jewish community and instant credibility. <laughs> and another another example of this dynamic uh, is in uh, Second Baruch, also in uh, chapter fifty nine. Um. Um, starting verse four, let me look here. Uh, for he showed him, or so he showed Moses, is the context there, many warnings together with the ways of the law and the end of time. So also to you, and then further also the likeness of Zion with its measurements, which was to be made after the likeness of the present sanctuary. But he also showed him at that time the measure of fire, the depth of the abyss, the weight of the winds, the number of the raindrops, the suppression of wrath, the abundance of long suffering, the truth of judgment, the root of wisdom, the riches of understa- richness of understanding, the fountain of knowledge, the height of the air, the greatness of paradise, the end of the periods, the beginning of the day of judgment. <sighs> That's a lot. It showed him a lot of stuff. A lot. A lot of stuff. Wow. So, so, um, so, so basically, th- these th- it's it's amplified. Like his role as a as a rev- revelatory prophet gets amplified in a lot of these writings, and so it shouldn't it shouldn't seem. Odd or out of place that Jesus all all of a sudden has the visionary encounter with the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses of all people is there right. as uh, the Lord. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, the experience is related to you know a vision, visionary experience of the kingdom of God. Seems like to me, and so it, it shouldn't be a surprise that Moses appears. Right, uh, very consistent with. Kind of how he's seen in Second Temple lit, right? And his authority, you know, as far as an interpreter of redemptive history and Jewish apocalypticism is represented at the Mount of Transfiguration, um, because you know the tradition that develops after that, because. Nobody in in Deuteronomy 34, it says nobody knows where he was buried to this day. And so that kind of that gets extrapolated also that, you know, that Moses was taken up and, and didn't actually die. And so then those are the the uh, two guys that appear on the Mount Transfiguration. And you have this in Jewish apocalyptic literature, you have this kind of uh, angelization of of Moses 
based on when he came down after the second time he went up on the mountain and his face was shining and uh which also adds to that's a fancy word you should explain that explain <laughs> right. that word so, that's really so fancy. there's a there's an article that <laughs> on <laughs> uh called the apocalyptic moses of second temple judaism uh which is an okay article uh but basically his main point is that uh moses is an- angelified and yeah, the, he goes through angelified. An angelified, that <laughs> would be the word. Uh, the mm-hmm. an- angelization. I'm not sure the the correct uh, <laughs> emphasis on which syllable I'm supposed to put that <laughs> right. on. Um, but anyway, so First Enoch 89 is uh, is a great example in the animal apocalypse where the Israel is pictured as sheep and Moses is the leader of the sheep and uh, and. Moses gets changed into a human and humans in the a- animal apocalypse are always angels throughout throughout yeah. the whole revelation. And so it says, so that sheep, Moses took some of uh, the other different sheep together with them and came to those sheep which had gone astray. So he's talking about the... Uh, uh, the golden calf incident. And he says he took them that went astray, slaying them, and the sheep became frightened in his presence. And he, that sheep, thus caused those sheep which went astray to return and brought them back into their folds. I continued to see in that vision till that sheep was transformed into a man and built a house for the Lord of the sheep and placed the sheep in it. And so, in the vision, Moses becomes a, 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 a human, which represents him becoming like an angel, which plays into the whole idea that he has substantial revelation and, and authority from God. So this plays into the end of the animal apocalypse where the Messiah appears and he builds a greater house. So it says in the last chapter, in chapter 90, then I stood still looking at that ancient house being transformed, the one that Moses built that the sheep were in. And so uh, he says, verse 29, I went on seeing until the Lord of the sheep brought about a new house, greater and loftier than the first one, and set it up in the first location which had been covered up. All its pillars were new, the columns were new, the ornaments new, as well as greater than those of the first, that is the old house, which was gone. All of the sheep were within it. And so you get this uh, kind of relationship between Moses and the Messiah, and the two build a house for the people of Israel, which I think, you know, gets echoed in, in Hebrews 3, where it talks about Jesus, the apostle and, and high priest, who is faithful uh, uh, right. to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. And so, uh, so you get that kind of association between Moses and the Messiah, yeah, another another one uh, that comes to mind again along the same lines of of just the emphasis on the depth of revelation that Moses had, and it's less weird than John's passage with all the animals <laughs> and people. My passage was cool. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Testament of Moses. <clears throat> uh, chapter start in chapter nine, the end of chapter nine, verse six, but then go. Uh, chapter 10. Um, <clears throat> chapter 10 is like a hymn, uh, known as the eschatological hymn. But um, so it talks, so Moses is, so the context is Moses is prophesying to Joshua just as he's about to die about what's going to happen in the history of the nation. And uh, he gets here and <clears throat> he says, let us rather die than transgress the commandments of the Lord. It's about an event in the future. The, uh, the Lord of lords, the God of our fathers, for if we do this and do die, our blood will be avenged before the Lord. Then his kingdom will appear throughout his whole creation. Then the devil will have an end. Yea, sorrow will be led away with him. Then will be filled the hands of the messenger who is in the highest place appointed. Yea, he will at once avenge them of their enemies, for the heavenly one will arise from his kingly throne. Yea, he will go forth from his holy habitation 
with indignation and wrath on behalf of his sons, and the earth will tremble even to its ends shall it be shaken, and the high mountains will be made low, yea, they will be shaken, as in closed valleys they will fall. The sun will not give its light, and in darkness the horns of the moon will flee, yea, they will be broken in pieces. It will be turned wholly into blood, yea, even the circle of the stars will be thrown into disarray. So That's pretty this, apocalyptic. Pretty <laughs> apocalyptic. That All that imagery is pretty... Uh, You know, that becomes pretty defining imagery for the apocalyptic revelation about the end of the age, um, both in the Tanakh and beyond the Tanakh. But uh, so same. that's the same context, is that Moses isn't just a prophet or a messenger of the commands of God. Moses has actually been entrusted with the oracles and and has been told by God about... uh, about the future and how history is going to go down. And, and, and despite having some of that recorded in the Tanakh, uh, some of that is kind of played out and, and, uh, you know, messed with a little bit in second temple literature, as far as what they assume some of those encounters with God entailed. Yeah, Bill, that's great. Well, one thing that I'm thinking of, I mean, John, you brought up the point earlier that Moses was like a precursor to the Messiah and how Second Temple literature really lays out Moses in this way. So expound a little bit upon that if you could. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as uh, you don't get a lot of like direct association that there's this Moses and then there's a greater Moses, you know, that's coming. Uh, but generally, Moses is related in light of kind of redemptive history moving towards its climactic messianic end. And so, you know, what God did through Moses is a precursor of what God will do at the end climactically. And so a, a number of your, like the, the animal apocalypse or the cloud apocalypse in second Baruch that, you know, those two that we referenced, the whole point is the rehearsing of Israel's redemptive history, shaping it towards its ultimate climactic and messianic end. And you get that, you know, that's the point of a lot of Jewish apocalyptic literature, whether it's the life of Adam and Eve or the book of Jubilees or Pseudophilo. It's really the same idea as rehearsing Israel's history, but tailoring it and shaping it towards this kind of uh, apocalyptic messianic uh, focus and expectation, which is lacking in the text itself you know, in the Hebrew Bible. And so it's kind of, it's a little bit like the Targums also. It's an adding to the text, filling it out, pushing it towards its ultimate end. Yeah, John, I I think that Hebrews 11 comes to mind when you say all that. It really is just a retelling of the same thing, that the history, but eschatologically oriented. It, it's the exact same thing. Yeah, that's good. Um yeah, and the other the other thing that that kind of connects in the in the New New Testament writings that kind of connects the idea of Moses as the prophet entrusted with the oracles of God and eschatology is there's some there's a couple of references to back to um Deuteronomy 18 and this kind of conversation between God and Moses about raising up a prophet like him. And so, like you have uh, Acts uh, three twenty two, um, like the, in in Acts three where he says, "Therefore repent and return, so that your sins may be blotted out, and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets." And then verse 22, that's leading up to there, verse 22, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, and you will listen to him. So this this concept of a prophet like Moses is actually something that gives uh, credibility to a, some, a, a new prophetic figure that was anticipated. Um, Stephen says the same thing in Acts 7. 
God, uh, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. And in reality, actually kind of surprisingly to me, there is not a lot of material on the expectation of a prophet like Moses in the a lot of the literature that we have from the Second Temple period. Um, I think there's a couple of things in the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I remember correctly. But the fact that it's used two or three times as a reference to people in, in, in an effort to basically compel them to believe that Jesus was the one that God sent um, definitely indicates there's some sort of anticipation of, of this figure who's going to be a prophet like Moses, and and essentially that's a way to give him credibility in their eyes. Right? They wouldn't they wouldn't just quote Deuteronomy eighteen as a, right. a greater <laughs> prophet coming along unless there was that kind of expectation. You know, right. they exactly. wouldn't quote it without giving explanation of it and right expounding exactly. Not upon just it. yeah, exactly. There's no explanation, so clearly people understand. Yeah, Bill. Well, this it makes me think even how during the time of uh, this is well really don't know exactly when this happened uh, there there may be some debate on um who this guy was but i'm thinking of thutis of how, how josephus in his uh, antiquities of the jews lays out a man named thutis who claimed to be a deliverer like moses and this is kind of presented as like a a negative example to the expectation of the precursor to the messiah that the the New Testament and uh, Second Temple literature, literature is laying out, and uh, this is in Antiquities of the Jews, chapter twenty, section ninety seven. Josephus is talking about a man named Thutis who basically persuaded a whole bunch of people to take all of their stuff to go out to the Jordan River, where the Jordan River would part, because he was proclaiming to be a prophet, and he would be doing very Moses-like things. He would say, okay, I'm going to speak, and the river is going to part, and you're going to have easy passage over it. And Josephus says that many were deluded by his words. And I think the point that you just made, John, unless there was some sense of expectation of this prophet-like figure, this prophet like Moses, is real not any point to appeal to the authority of Moses, right? So this is kind of a negative example from history, because clearly there's the point that we're making that Moses had authority because of the prophetic vision for the future, because of what the Tanakh and Second Temple literature has laid out in terms of who Moses is, and how, even as we're saying just in this latter part here, that he is a precursor to the Messiah. Yeah, so, I, you know, I think the, the takeaway from this is that uh, the way Jews read the historical narrative that you find in 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 Exodus is uh, maybe some people kind of approach that as uh, dubious or like it's there's some sort of trickery happening that they're inserting stuff. And it's not really that's not how, you know, they're thinking of it. It's more along the lines of uh, Hebrews 11, where it says, um, you know, that Moses chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Messiah to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. And so it never says any of that in Exodus, but... That's how, you know, that's the, the exhortation is that that's how we should be reading the, the story, the historical narrative. And that's what we should take away from it, that God did these things and revealed himself progressively in such a way to lead to an ultimate and final conclusion. And that this approach, this apocalyptic approach to reading Moses and the narrative around Moses is actually the best way for discipleship to exhort and encourage us to step out and not live for this age, embrace, you know, following God, even if that means danger or death, etc. And, and, uh, the, this is the, the, the best way forward that will ultimately produce a reward on the last day. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. Amen. 
Well, John and Bill, it's always great to be with you guys. I think in our next episode, we want to continue our look at Moses. Specifically, we want to highlight Mount Sinai and the events of Mount Sinai, the covenant, and uh, how Sinai is played out in Second Temple literature and then discussed in the New Testament as well. Uh, So with that said, listeners, thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.